Some killers attack complete strangers. Some target the vulnerable, the young or the elderly. And some prey on people that they know. There are killers who are inspired by money or by revenge, by sexual deviancy, by hatred. There are opportunists and there are meticulous planners. But what unites these men and women is one simple trait. And it's the most terrifying thing of all. They live amongst us. In our towns, on our streets, in our houses. They're just like the rest of us, but capable of evil. And they could be anywhere. Welcome to Murder Town. Do you feel it in the air? Oh. Every part of the UK has a place where murder is an all too frequent occurrence. Tonight we're in Scotland and the beautiful but sinister city of Dundee. It's known as the big village where everybody knows everybody and where killers can sometimes lurk unnoticed. very, very unusual for us to deal with an attack that's so violent and where there's no link between the victim and the offender. People were disgusted by the nature and the violence of the attack. It's the mean that led me to believe that he's just evil. At that point, I still didn't know what was going to live. I'm a senior reporter with the local evening newspaper, the Evening Telegraph. It's not a huge city, the population is about 148,000 currently. It's often described as a village. And working as a reporter here, it's surprising how time and time again you come into contact with the same people. We are also an area of high deprivation, high poverty. We have a very, very serious drug addiction problem. So it's a, a city of major contrast in a very small, small area. In the past two years, we've actually had quite a few murders, unfortunately. We've had a couple of double murders. There are areas at night where you would be canny where you walked. Just outside the centre, in the leafy suburbs to the north, residents regarded it as a safe place to be. I was born here and lived here all my life. I was at school with um, my husband. It was my childhood sweetheart and we married as teenagers not long after leaving school. So I never ever had the inclination to go anywhere else. I had a nice, happy home. Bringing up my children, you go through the usual things of making sure they're safe with the roads and don't talk to strangers and all the things that I was taught, don't ever get in anybody's car that you don't know and never any major fears that 
there's any horror or we're living with a, a big place like London where you're hearing about shootings and stabbings and this, that and the next thing, you know, that to me is frightening. Here in Dundee, I've always thought it was relatively safe. Typical Monday, my husband always leaves first and I get spoiled, I always get a cup of tea taken up to me to bed. And then I get up and I get my shower and go to work. I work mornings um, in the local hospital at Nine Miles and when I'd finished my, my work, I come home. It was a beautiful sunny day. Um, it was absolutely gorgeous that 7th of August. It was really busy. It was really busy out there. It was, as, I, as I went out my gate and I went to the entrance um, of Templeton Woods, there was a man and he had so many dogs. The amount of people that you met when you were out was you didn't know their names, you knew their dogs' names. People were friendly, people always spoke to everybody knew Betsy's name. The route I do is the, the usual route. I know the route's like the back of my hands. I saw another couple of gentlemen and they had a wee terrier and usual wave and walk past them. And then really that was it until, you know, on my route back, Just hell, just hell, just hell. Just, Linda, you're dead. That, no getting away. I was just going home. I, I, I just was going home. It was my last bit going home, facing, facing where my house would be. You would think you were just going to wake up and it was, it was a mistake, do you know what I mean? That, like, no. to describe what he looked like because if I died, nobody would know and he would do it to somebody else. And then a lady um, called Joyce, she lay down with me and she just kept speaking to me and asking me questions because I just remember saying, it's terrible what I said to that lady, but I just begged her not to go because I didn't want to die on my own. Linda was fighting for her life as ambulances and police rushed to the scene. But her attacker was now making his escape. In 2017, the Scottish city of Dundee was about to be rocked by news of a devastatingly violent attack. The victim, Linda MacDonald, had been repeatedly hit over the head with a dumbbell as she walked in a local park. Now, passers-by had rushed to her aid and called the cops. The radio messages I seem to remember was uh, referring to a woman who'd been attacked in the area of Templeton Woods. First of all, I think that sounds quite unusual, and certainly for the time of day as well, it was midday. We 
wouldn't normally receive calls of that nature on a regular basis. So at that point, we were aware this was going to be a very significant incident. Available officers were coming from all areas of the police service. So we had officers from uniform response policing, we had dog handlers, we also had road policing unit and supported by detective officers as well. Officers were attending there pretty properly and the messages coming back, you know, it was a genuine attempt on this person. The attack took place just on the path here, but during the course of the attack, Linda was dragged from the pathway down into the kind of wooded area here beside the, the mountain bike tracks. Uh, and it was here that she was found by other members of the public. It felt like hours. It felt like about two hours from even getting to the ambulance. And I'm sure it wasn't, but I felt like I was there for hours. The uh, inner cordon had been established um, by that time, so the scene was effectively secured and under our control. There was obviously signs of the attack. There was blood evident just in the, the area of the bushes there, along with articles of clothing um, that belonged to Linda and to members of the public who'd kind of uh, rendered assistance to her. I think I remember just being frustrated seeing when the ambulance crew have to do their job because it's a head injury, but I just remember just saying, well, get me out of here, because it was that, I had to get out of the woods. Despite the fact that she'd just been the victim of a very violent attack, Linda was able to give a detailed description of her attacker. A description had also been passed in the direction of travel that the suspect had made often, and that was critical. The big thing was to just keep saying what you looked like, what you looked like, what you looked like, get him, you need to get him, because what if he went away and then half an hour later he did something to somebody else? I just had to know that they had to get the person because he can't just be left to run and they don't know who it is. At that point, I didn't know if, I still didn't know I was going to live. Linda was rushed to hospital and placed in intensive care. Doctors feared she could lose her fight for life with serious head injuries. But while medical teams did their best, police were already hunting for the attacker. The area of Templeton Woods, it's on logistically, and it's a very difficult area to put a cordon on. We have to, to basically take the cordon as wide as we possibly can to try and make sure that we're covering every potential point where somebody could enter into that area or make their way from the area. We're also putting officers into the area, including specialist officers such as dog handlers, to try and pick up the track of the person to try and identify where they've gone to after the attack. Officers sealed off the woods for forensic examination, but this wouldn't be the first time that the woods had hosted violence. Almost 40 years earlier, the bodies of two women were found in the same piece of Dundee woodland. Carol Lannan disappeared in March 1979. A year later, Elizabeth McCabe vanished from a nightclub. Both women had been stripped naked and strangled before being dumped in the woods. But while those murders remained unsolved, police were now back in the area, and news of their presence was spreading around the city. People are very quick in Dundee to phone us at the paper if there's a big police presence. You know, there's cars, there's ambulances, there's dogs. So we get told, yes, something is happening. The story began to unfold, and it did unfold quite quickly, that there was an attempted murder. We didn't know the condition of the victim straight off, and we were just following the story 
you know, get in touch with the local police, in touch with the Scottish Ambulance, to try to get a feel of, of what had happened. It would be unusual to see the, the level of police activity that there was um, and the response that we had to the attack on Linda. So word does spread quickly and on top of that we obviously have the consideration these days uh, of word obviously spreading through social media use as well. So within minutes of police arriving, the public were learning that an attacker might be on the loose and they were demanding answers. The police were very cagey initially in Dundee. Um, we were asking all the questions, we were wanting to know as much as possible, we wanted to, to break the story as much as we can as it's happening. This is like a nasty attack on their doorsteps and it's our duty to report it and to make them aware of what is going on. But while journalists were still in the dark about exactly what had happened, eagle-eyed police officers were one step closer to finding out. Just over an hour after the original call to the police, we received notification from uh, officers who were manning some of the points on the cordon that they observed a male who fitted the description that had been passed by Linda entering uh, a block of flats within the you know, village of Bridge Foot, which uh, is a short distance from the locus itself. The man officers had seen was a local who was known to the police. He'd first hit their radar back in 2001. Dundee Law, it's a viewpoint, beautiful viewpoint. It's got a memorial up there. It gives us views all around um, the city. It's a place to walk your dog. It's a place to take your children to play. It is just, it's iconic in Dundee. For anyone who wanted to go and you know, create mischief up there, there are lots of paths, there are steps, there's lots of ways up and down, so it would be easy to avoid detection. There's not some place that you would necessarily expect a horrific crime to be committed. was just what you'd say would be a, a genuinely nice person. Anne just enjoyed her, her walks with her dog and up into that area, you know. She was, she was known by other dog walkers. I understand that her dog went home and Anne's partner went looking for her on the law and I think he came across her, her body. Just a normal day, had worked until about six at night, had gone home, uh, had my tea, just, and then got the phone call. It was basically the, the usual call that you get from the control room, we've got a suspicious death. So I would just tell the control room, right, I'll make my way directly to the location. When I arrived there, it was painfully obvious that the lady had met a violent death. The brutality of the attack on Anne was particularly bad. And there was just, in Dundee at that time, a feeling of real shock, real revulsion. There was fear, there was genuine fear. This, you know, this is Dundee, this is the law, this is somebody we all know, somebody we went to school with. <laughs> What's happened, you know? And I think there was just this desire on everyone's part to get to the bottom of who'd, who'd committed this horrific attack on, on Anne. The unusual one of this was that it was broad daylight. It was the middle of summer and it was a reasonably busy area. There was nothing that we could immediately go to to say, right, let's track our movements. You know, it was a case of let's 
would make appeals to dog walkers, anyone who may have seen her, taxi drivers, anything like that, who may be able to give us information. Police do look at people known to the victims of crime, you know, the relatives, friends, boyfriends, partners, former partners. But it wasn't going anywhere, there was nothing coming up, and I think they had to widen their net. So officers tracked down everyone they could in the hope that somebody could help the inquiry. They traced several people who had been on the law and a group of children playing nearby, and all of them were questioned. You can't leave any individual element, whether it be the, the kids that were playing in the playground nearby, the adults that were walking their dogs, the taxi drivers who may have used that route, people all round about your door-to-door -door investigations, which can be quite extensive. People are very good uh, when it comes to these things uh, coming forward uh, to speak to you, especially those who have perhaps seen uh, what they believe something to be very, very significant. And that was what happened in this case. One witness claimed she'd seen a youth dressed all in blue, close to the spot where Anne was killed. So you've got this, this group of kids, but you've got to remember that what we're looking at here, your initial thoughts are, hey, this isn't a kid who's committed this crime. This has got to be something older, although little boy blue did bring in this, this lower age profile. So were police looking for a youth? Everything about the crime suggested that this was a calculated, violent killer. But now police had to accept that it could be someone who wasn't yet an adult. Police in Dundee were investigating the violent murder of a young woman called Anne Nicholl. She'd been attacked as she walked her dog on a hill in the town known as Dundee Law. Detectives were shocked by the level of violence, but were now learning that witnesses nearby suspected the killer could be a teenager. Your initial thoughts are, hey, this isn't a kid who's committed this crime. But then, of course, he made his, his one mistake. One name police couldn't shake off was Robbie McIntosh. He was a 15-year-old who'd been playing in the park, and when he was questioned, he denied any involvement. But then the police learned he'd been gossiping about the murder in a local chip shop before police even knew anyone was dead. That, as far as the, uh, the counter-assistant was concerned, was, was pretty critical. She was able to give us exact timings. There was a live show of EastEnders on that night, um, and the theme tune was being played, and she was desperate to see it while she was serving him, and he was telling her about the incident that had occurred on the law. No one could possibly have known that there was a female murdered in that area uh, when McIntosh said there was. So 15-year-old McIntosh had let slip that there was a murder before anyone else knew. And that put him on top of the list of suspects. So his house was searched. We put in designated search teams. And although... <laughs> The clothing worn by him that night had all been washed. There was one pair of socks that were found in a drawer uh, folded inside each other. The, one of the searchers had opened this out and there was a small speck of red, and it was a small speck, on the inside of the cuff of the sock. And DNA investigation turned up trumps in that uh, that DNA and that blood stain was, was added.
It had taken several days for the DNA results to come back, but now the suspicions of the police were confirmed, it was time to make an arrest. Although cops still weren't sure that Robbie McIntosh was the only guilty party. All the kids that were at the play park uh, that day, we wanted to bring them in just to go over their stories again. And uh, we wanted to bring McIntosh in as well. And when they went to McIntosh's house, he was gone. We were told that he's away to Glasgow Airport. But his sister's leaving that day to go to Canada. And we're not too sure if he's going to go with her. eventually brought in here uh, and he was brought in for interview. Uh, an experienced interview team, very experienced interview team, who could not get a word out of him. He said nothing, nothing whatsoever. He was as cool and as calm as you can imagine. It was like watching something in a film with a so-called hardened criminal who just sat there and knew that if he said nothing, then probably nothing would come of it. He was confident and pretty articulate. He came across as a switched on young man. He wasn't crumbling under the police attention at the time, which is chilling. A teenager at that age could commit that, then methodically go about trying to cover his tracks and, and go about, you know, the aftermath, the way that, that Robbie did go about the aftermath. I had interviewed people in the past who never said anything, but never anyone as young uh, as Martin Tosh. He was a, he was a one-off, uh, there was no doubt about that. Um, and there was obviously this, this cold, calculating, I can get away with this mindset that he had. Uh, it was, it was pretty weird, uh, to say the least. McIntosh hadn't reckoned on the DNA being found on his sock, and that was enough to press charges of murder. After a lengthy trial, 16-year-old Robbie McIntosh was found guilty and given a life sentence behind bars. We went to a young offenders institution initially, uh, and then moved into the prison system. But there was a massive review of sentences in Scotland, and it said anyone getting a life sentence should actually have a tariff placed on that, so that they do have a target to, to get out. While Macintosh served his sentence, the city of Dundee still lived with the horror of what he'd done and tragically had to deal with even more bloodshed. In 2008, Robert Cunningham was found guilty of culpable homicide after killing his girlfriend's 23-month-old son. And in 2010, serial sex attacker Patrick Ray raped and murdered a mother of three after a night out in the city centre. As other crimes hit the headlines, by 2017, the city had begun to forget about Macintosh, just as he was nearing the end of his sentence. There was a general feeling that he had done a lot of time. He was a boy when he went to prison, he's now a man in his 30s. So he may not indeed be that same person that committed that initial horrific crime. But the wheels were in motion for McIntosh to be given a second chance at freedom. Despite some concerns, Robbie McIntosh was trusted to have periods of home leave. She 
she was very strongly of the opinion that no, he ought not to be out. She, she had a genuine fear, concern that what he had done to her sister was something that potentially could happen again. Police spotted a man matching the attacker's description entering a flat nearby just minutes after the attack had happened. And it was the same flat that McIntosh lived in. The police were there very, very quickly and the whole area was cordoned off. In comparison to where the attack happened, it's close, it's not, it's not far. The officers attended there and carried out some initial inquiries to identify which flat the male had gone into and in identifying the address, identified that it was linked to Robbie McIntosh. Even before the name emerges, there was this, I think, this undercurrent that this, this is a wee bit too reminiscent of what happened back in the early 2000s. There was just that, that feeling in Dundee of, oh my goodness, is this happening all over again? I was aware of McIntosh's previous conviction, having been a serving officer at the time of the original murder on the Law Hill, um, and the fact that a potential suspect matching his description had gone back into that address was extremely significant. At that time, I directed detective officers to secure McIntosh and to secure the house as well as a potential scene. The washing machine was on, there was clothing in the washing machine. So it almost paints a picture as if well, Robbie's possibly involved in this and as soon as he's got home, he's taken all his clothing off, he's trying to wash the clothing. There's footwear we're interested in, there's a suggestion that a weapon might be involved as well, so again, we're looking for evidence of that. When they entered, McIntosh was dressed only in his boxer shorts. Um, he did have what appeared to be an injury to his hand, and there was some blood, I believe, on his boxer shorts. There was a pair of boots that were recovered from within uh, the lounge there that had a apparent blood spotting on them, um, so they were recovered. Um, there was various uh, blood spots in that within the flat as well, and as, uh, there was two dumbbells that we also recovered from in uh, a cupboard that were in Robbie's bedroom. It was striking that these dumbbells actually fitted the description provided by Linda very closely and that they were nickel-plated dumbbells. Robbie McIntosh was now the prime suspect and Dundee was convinced he was banged to rights. But could he really have struck again? just days into his release from prison. In 2017, police in Dundee could be forgiven for having a sense of deja vu. They were once again on the trail of Robbie McIntosh. They suspected he was responsible for a violent attack in Templeton Woods that had left a woman fighting for her life. But quick thinking officers had closed in on him, caught him in his blood stained boxer shorts, and placed him under arrest. He was once again in the police's grasp. But McIntosh didn't appear to be concerned. He wasn't saying like shouting, swearing, or saying anything that had happened at all. Just quiet, calm, not caused a fuss. Um, did everything that was asked of him without any bother at all. Yeah, compliant was probably the best word to describe him. He was subsequently interviewed, but um, made no comment to all the questions that were put to him. Given uh, the description that we had in the time frame and the distances involved, it likely was going to be Robbie. However, you've still got it in the back of your mind. It might not be him, so let's just 
make sure we're doing what we do here is right. You know, don't cut corners. But while Robbie wasn't giving anything away in the interview, more evidence would emerge that would inform the police about where he'd been. Neighbours of Robbie's had video footage of him leaving that day, walking his time scale when he came back. Um, and he just seemed to walk very purposefully along the road to, to Clato, carry out the attack on Linda. The camera first catches Robbie at 11.42 a.m., leaving his home and heading in the direction of the woods. It then picks him up again at 2.19 p.m., arriving home. Crucially, the attack on Linda had occurred around 1 p.m., right in the middle of his time out of the house. There was no mad frenzy or he wasn't out drinking out in the town. It was just as if all along he had made up his mind that he would do something again. How do you just go out and load up your dumbbell and go and attack some woman who's not known to you, happily walking a dog in the park? Thankfully, the police had moved quickly, spotting McIntosh and dispatching officers to arrest him. Just minutes after he'd returned home, officers arrived en masse and their arrest was caught on camera. That evening, we had enough to arrest McIntosh for the attack and to put him to court the following day. There was this feeling of disbelief, I suppose, but tempered with, well, people said, people warned. The case didn't proceed to trial. McIntosh submitted a, a plea of guilty to the offences. You obviously get a degree of satisfaction, uh, both myself and members of the inquiry team, that you know we've managed to get justice for Lynn and her family but also for the wider members of the, the public in Dundee. All the time that Robbie was being investigated, Linda was recovering from her horrific injuries. It was blunt trauma to my head, two fractures to the base of my skull, and my thumb had to be reattached um, because obviously I was trying to defend myself and putting my, my hand up. So the palm of my hand split and the thumb came off. I found out later on um, that the fractures to the skull probably saved my life because all the bleeding and all the pressure, instead, instead of it going into your brain, it came out, it comes out into your face and your neck and all the way down. So it looked a bit like the elephant man, but you know, it was, it was good in a way. I was actually off of work for six months. Every time I went to see my GP, it was, please let me go back to work. It was almost like, you need to get your life back. You want everything to be back the way it was. So there was a sort of psychological thing that of saying, if I get back to work, I'll get back to a routine and I'll, you know, I'll have that life that I had before this happened. But it changes you. It's almost like you don't know who you are. I feel different about certain things. But there's one part of Linda's life that she'll never get back. I don't go in the woods at all. I don't go there at all. I wouldn't go in any woods. I would never, ever go in any woods. There's no point of torturing yourself either. What would be the point of me going in there? It's just, it's just a reminder, is it? It's just a reminder of the evil. For me, it's the devil in the woods, the monster. 
It's, it's never going to be the way it was before. While Linda continues her recovery, the city of Dundee is still asking how the attack was allowed to happen, just days after McIntosh was released back into the community. People were angry. Police officers were angry, members of the public were angry. It affected a lot of people. A lot of blame was put in various areas. Why was he allowed out? Why was he not locked up forever? This really ought not to have happened. How many home leaves has he had that he's been up there roaming about just waiting for an opportunity? It was just a time bomb. It was just waiting to happen, wasn't it? He didn't know me. I, d I didn't even speak. I d he didn't speak. You know, you're like, why? Why? I says to him, why? Why are you doing this? Nothing. No answer. Nothing. He's not human. He's evil. He's pure evil. The, the part of his brain that would have to show empathy and, and understanding and all these emotions doesn't work. It doesn't work. While authorities insist that the attack couldn't have been predicted, many, including the family of Anne Nicholl, disagree. I had built a little bit of a relationship with Anne's sister and she'd said on several occasions, don't, you know, he shouldn't be allowed out. From a personal point of view, I felt if McIntosh was ever released that he would reoffend. Just the whole demeanour of McIntosh at that time uh, led me to believe that he's just evil. At that time, you just have this overwhelming feeling of, I didn't die, I didn't die, I'm alive. Why did I survive this? It's like a euphoric feeling to say, I'm alive, that this is a miracle. It wasn't meant to be today. This case shows how even in the most tranquil and beautiful of places, danger could be just around the corner. Robbie McIntosh had only been out of prison for a few days, but he couldn't resist the urge to commit violence. And it's only by sheer luck that his second victim didn't die. The only hope for the people of Dundee is that lightning doesn't strike for a third time. <laughs>